So, when professionals get it wrong, markets should move. Here we've included a rough guide as to how markets should move based on whether the actual economic release was stronger or weaker than expected, and it's sorted by asset class. We've broken down the market into five rough categories. First is fixed income, which is then broken into two subcategories, rates and credit. Without going into extensive detail, fixed income rates are more sensitive to macroeconomic themes, whilst fixed income credit is more sensitive to industry or company-specific news. Let's look at the business conditions. If a forecast for business conditions is stronger than the market expects, it means that the potential for central banks to possibly tighten the monetary policy and raise rates is higher, so bond prices fall. The opposite is also true. If an economic release indicates that business conditions are weaker, then the chance that central banks will loosen monetary policy goes up. Hence, fixed income rates products should rally and prices will go up. When you look at inflation, you will see that naturally, higher than expected inflation will be detrimental to fixed income rates and cause prices to fall. When expected inflation is weaker than expected, fixed income rates will increase in price. For fixed income credit, on the other hand, which is closer to equities, as they are claims against the future financial health of the issuer, they react negatively to worsening business conditions or economic health. However, inflationary pressures also place pressure on fixed income credit and equity prices, as the present value of the future cash flows expected diminish. Both fixed income credit and equities tend also to outperform when business conditions are better than forecasted as earnings and repayment prospects improve. For fixed ink or for foreign exchange rather, let's assume that we're talking about the domestic currency versus an imaginary basket of all other currencies. Whenever economic health is strong, the domestic currency tends to rise versus that basket as one would reasonably expect capital to come into the country for investment. Same goes for inflation, as higher inflation leads to higher rates in the short run, which caused the domestic currency to rally. If business conditions are worse than the market expects, you can also expect the opposite to happen, which is capital may f uh, leave the domestic currency in a capital flight, which causes the currency to weaken. Lastly, let's look at commodities. The prices of commodities are most positively correlated to the economic cycle. That is, if the economy is stronger than expected, demand for commodities should be higher as well, as more will be consumed or used. The opposite is also true in that weaker business conditions won't require as much raw materials or commodities. However, many commodities also have specific drivers of their price, whether it be geopolitics for crude oil or weather for orange juice prices. I would encourage you to take our course on commodities fundamentals if you're interested in learning more. So the magnitude of the market's reaction to surprises may also differ. Here are three scenarios to demonstrate how markets may not react as expected in the real world. Firstly, releases may be overshadowed by other more important news such as war or disease or other conflicts, or they could also be overshadowed by more micro data, such as an individual's company earnings. The market may also have priced in data based on estimates, leaks, or related data. For example, if we look at US payrolls, a third party called ADP provides labor releases that come out before the payrolls. And there is a positive correlation between ADP and the payrolls number. And the ADP strongly hints at the labor market picture. So market participants may actually trade on that. So by the time the payroll number comes out, market reaction may be muted. The third situation could be due to other market conditions such as holidays, which impacts market liquidity and the fact that many market participants may be away from the office. It could also be that upcoming data would be more important, so the market is taking a more wait and see position. So now that we've examined how the market is expected to move and by how much it may move after economic events, let's look at the different types of players that trade these economic events. First of all, sell side. So these are companies or entities that sell financial instruments to the buy side. Generally, these are the investment banks of the world. You may have heard of names like JP Morgan, and 
Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank. The next category of uh, market practitioners would be buy side clients, and these are generally institutions that invest in the financial instruments offered by the sell side. Um, most commonly, these types of uh, clients would be people such as asset managers, pension funds, central banks, even private banks that operate on behalf of individuals. But generally, buy side um, clients are the ones that invest money on behalf of other people. Next one would be market makers. So these are entities that provide bids and offers to the market, either electronically or by voice, and they look to profit from clients crossing that spread, the bid offer spread. Um, generally, these would be companies such as brokers, intermarket brokers, uh, but they don't take positions. Uh, they just simply try and match client orders on either side as to be flat. The last broad class of market practitioners that like to trade these economic events would be prop desks. Uh, these are individuals and uh, trading desks that uh, trade financial instruments with company funds and not with investor funds. And their main goal is just to maximize profit for the firm. Regardless of which broad class you fall into, these market participants all look to maximize profit by timing trades based on the market direction or volatility after economic events. So they can take exposure in a few different ways. The first is by using cash. And when I say cash, that means that they're buying or selling the physical asset, such as a stock, a bond, a currency, or a commodity. They look to potentially reverse the trade once prices have moved in their favor or to buy when assets are cheaper and sell when assets are more expensive. Uh, this sort of trade does tie up a lot of precious balance sheet as it requires large investment amounts. And this sort of trade may not work for market makers such as brokers, uh, who as I mentioned earlier, want to match up buyers and sellers and maintain a flat position at the end of the day. That kind of leads us to futures. Uh, not only is it less balance sheet intensive and allow for counterparties to offload risks via a central exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange for stocks or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for commodities, future contracts also have a standardized size called a lot size and standardized expiries. These expiries, meaning the dates that these futures come due, are important as market participants may want the future expiry before or after an economic event possibly as a hedge, uh, but future transactions, while having less counterparty uh, risk, do require margin requirements uh, to be paid to the respective exchanges. Having said that, it does provide leverage for traders. The third type of uh, investment product you might see people put on would be forward contracts. They're more bespoke and they don't trade on exchanges. So market participants do have to take on counterparty risk for the duration of the contract. However, uh, they also have a way of putting on trades before ec important economic events if the trader believes that the market has not priced in what she feels is the most probable outcome by buying or selling a future for a date beyond the economic question, the economic event in question. The last of my examples, but definitely not an exhaustive list, would be derivative related trades. One can buy and sell put or call options to express their view on economic releases or about the market in general. They do have a bit more counterparty risk to be taken on as your counterparty needs to be around when your option expires so that you can collect your profits. However, they don't require as much balance sheet as trades can be bespoke with all sorts of structures to capture your view. So for FX traders, um, uh, some weird names and fancy payouts I may have heard in the past would be stuff like double no-touch knock-in options. By using one of these products or a combination of these products, uh, one can actually trade economic events outright. You can trade it with a hedge or hedge your exposure by using caps and floors and options. Or you can trade the volatility of the event by using straddles and strangles or using volatility indices or indexes like the VIX. To learn more about each security and how they react and how to trade these, I would encourage you to look at our fixed income trading course as well as our introduction to FX course. In this course, we explore different types of economic events, how central banks operate, and their policy measures. Then we moved on to important economic indicators that market practitioners pay attention to. And we wrapped up with how these practitioners trade using these economic information. Now you should have a thorough understanding of how economics impacts financial markets. 
central banks and their role, as well as understand how specific economic news impacts various markets. You should also have an idea of how market practitioners use this information to trade or invest. This course is an essential building block required for the CMSA, and the concepts discussed in this course will be a foundation in future courses when we go into derivatives, options, and bonds in more detail. By understanding the fundamental economic decisions involved, you'll be able to build upon that and learn more about financial markets.